Hello, I'm Dr. Tanya Dvork. I'm here with Dr. Sue Noakes and Dr. Doran Boulder. He's from Louisiana State University and Dr. Noakes and I are from the University of Kentucky and we're here to discuss the first three years that have completed of the NSF EBSCOR R2 Track 2 project titled Assembling Successful Structures, Lignin Beads for Sustainability of Food, Energy, and Water Systems. Thank you both for joining me today. Dr. Boulder, would you mind giving us a brief overview of the project? So this project uh, got its seeds in our discussions with, uh, with Dr. Noakes over a, you know, professional interactions that we have over the years in our field. And uh, it germinated from the fact that uh, we both work in uh, utilization of agricultural uh, resources and one of the most uh, underutilized or underused agricultural resource is the lignin streams that come out from the various uh, corn ethanol plants, uh, biofuel plants, or pulp and paper mills. And uh, the utilization of lignin at the current uh, status is just as a, as a basic fuel source being burned for electricity generation. But the lignin itself is a very valuable, contains very valuable uh, chemical compounds, is the only natural source of aromatic compounds, which uh, can be converted if the technology is developed, uh, can be converted into some really important chemicals and or fuels with high value. So we, we started with putting together a team about five years ago, uh, collecting expertise from the various aspects of the of the project that we were trying to accomplish. And we came up with the idea that we can probably find a way to efficiently deconstruct this lignin source such that, which is a very uh, heterogeneous material with very complicated properties. And uh, we can deconstruct it in the sort of three or four basic compounds, which are the building blocks of this, of this uh, lignin material. And then we can use a ration, rational strategy to build back certain chemicals from the derived monomers. So, um, and sort of that uh, uh, the whole project revolves around this idea that we, we sort of deconstruct the lignin and then we use some uh, chemical strategies of linking these monomers in specific uh, motifs or uh, geometries. And then we use this you know, these molecules, both from the deconstructive portion and the reconstruction portion to see what kind of applications we can, we can envision that, um, that can be useful in the field of agriculture, uh, biomedical field, chemical processing, uh, water, water quality treatments, and, and sort of those, uh, those uh, kind of applications. But when we started, obviously, we didn't know what we we're going to end up with the applications. We sort of have some directions and some ideas we thought they're going to be useful. Uh, but uh, in the course of the project, we found out some, some very interesting applications ranging from um, uh, biomedical applications. Some of these compounds were found to be effective in uh, treatment of cancers. We, can, we found out we can build certain biomaterials out of them. We can uh, chemically link this lignin uh, monomers and, and uh, oligomers. With, um, with other type of uh, degradable polymers to make nanoparticles, to make films. We can functionalize them on surfaces uh, with uh, uh, interesting antimicrobial properties. So basically it can be used for packaging or, or something like that. And, uh, and we also have uh, developed ways in which we, we take the lessons that we learned in this project from our research perspective and uh, try to translate them, translate them into sort of a more um, easily digestible materials that can be used as educational or training materials for uh, high school, uh, especially vocational high schools in, uh, in rural areas in both Kentucky and Louisiana, but also you know, to incorporate them in our undergraduate and graduate courses at uh, LSU at the University of Kentucky. So what is the nature of the research conducted during this project? Dr. Noakes, could you tell a little bit about this? This is a very unique competition uh, that NSF runs. And one of the main objectives of this grant competition is to build research capacity across uh, EPSCOR jurisdictions. And both Kentucky and Louisiana are EPSCOR jurisdictions, which mean we receive less of the federal NSF money than some of the other states. 
So one of the objectives was to build capacity, research capacity, and the other was to mentor junior faculty. And the third one was to do the research. So we, through this grant, um, one of our challenges was to, um, to get the group to be a cohesive research group because uh, we knew some of the people before we started, but we didn't know everyone. And so we had a lot of, of learning to do. But the, the, main, um, the main technical area was the lignin, um, building up and breaking down lignin so that we can take advantage of the biochemicals that are used in lignin. Dr. Noakes, would you please go over objective one and provide some of the major outcomes and achievements of this objective? So our first objective um, dealt with organization of the collaboration and the, the overall objective was to develop a nationally recognized group of lignin researchers. And so we did this in several ways. One is to um, facilitate the collaboration Second was to improve some of our research capacity by um, acquiring new equipment and also sharing equipment across um, states between Louisiana and Kentucky. And then the third one was mentoring junior faculty. So both um, jurisdictions had junior faculty on the project, typically faculty who had just started at the university. And throughout the project, then they worked with the senior scientists and um, you ask about outcomes. And one of our most exciting outcomes is the professional progress of those junior faculty. They've gone from not having any grants to getting their own grants, to writing publications and to working collaboratively. Um, one of the aspects of this project is that we had outside evaluators that would come every year and see if we're making good progress towards our goals and the first year we kind of got yelled at because our collaboration was not as strong as we needed it to be because it's difficult to learn to collaborate with people you don't know very well. And um, doing research with a group of people takes a lot of trust because you have to make sure that they're going to um, include you on the findings if you were involved and, and that sort of thing. So um, we, we had to learn to collaborate. And by year four, we are so well collaborating that um, the evaluators were surprised and they're like, you're doing such a good job. And, and that's been really fun to get to know um, the other researchers and to learn to work together. Yeah, so if I, if I, if I can just, uh, you know, just add a little bit, I'm gonna let Sue, you know, elaborate a little more on that is that, uh, you know, with respect to the collaborations at the beginning of the project, we, we sort of had some uh, challenges that were not directly related to, you know, to the people involved, but were extenuated circumstances, natural disaster type of things. And, and, uh, and that sort of delayed our progress a little bit and, uh, and uh, also delayed our, you know, working with the graduate students, which is an important part of our you know, sort of the development of the of the collaboration is not involving just the faculty, uh, more senior and, and junior faculty, but also getting the, the graduate students, you know, their training wheels, you know, put them on or whatever, take them off and, and get them started. But, but we did have some interesting, uh, you know, uh, issues that we had to deal with at the start of the of the collaboration. Maybe Sue want to elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, so we were all set up to travel from Kentucky to Louisiana to have our first face-to-face -face meeting. And I think it was actually on the day we were supposed to travel, Baton Rouge got flooded. And I think half of the houses were submerged and they closed the university. It was closed for several weeks, I believe. Yes. So we didn't actually get to travel to uh, Louisiana. But then the next year, the Louisiana group came to Kentucky, and then we did get to go to Louisiana in year three. And um, this year, of course, we have COVID. So um, we're getting to do everything via Zoom, but we had done a lot of things via Zoom already because we were physically distanced. So in the objective two, we looked at, we looked at basically three different, several different methods 
to deconstruct the lignin, which comes in a very heterogeneous, very complex form. It's a huge matrix with, you know, three kinds or four kinds of molecules, but they're mixed in multiple different ways. And therefore you cannot use them for specific applications. So we used a uh, very successfully uh, uh, interjurisdictional collaboration uh, research uh, between uh, Dr. Shi's uh, group at Kentucky and some of my or some of the groups here at Louisiana, which used uh, new solvents and technologies such as um, uh, ionic liquids and uh, eutectic solvents to deconstruct these lignin materials. And we looked at uh, various thermochemical methods, basically high temperature in specific conditions using microwave heating or uh, uh, other kind of electromagnetic heating and also using uh, enzymatic type uh, degradation, so biochemical process in which you use uh, specific enzymes that work at higher temperatures. And we looked at how these enzymes are affected by the presence of the various solutes and, and in the chemical compounds, because these enzymes would be the ones that would sort of chop off the, the linkages between the different uh, monomers in the in the lignin. So we looked at the thermochemical process. This was very successful. On the thermochemical area, we, we used some high uh, energy type of sources, including lasers and the microwave, to uh, accelerate and control the rate of degradation of lignin. When I say degradation, I mean the construction of lignin. And we were able very successfully to obtain selective molecules out of this uh, lignin which basically meaning that in, in normal thermochemical processes, you obtain maybe uh, you know, a couple of hundred products uh, of, from the reaction. Uh, we were able to reduce using this technology, the number of, uh, of products to somewhere in the order of 20 to 30. Uh, and in some cases, even less than that very specific, you know, three or four compounds that we were able to obtain. So those were again, very successful. And that was a collaboration between the groups here at, at uh, LSU working in the thermochemical conversion and the analytical group at the University of Kentucky, which was led by Dr. Dr. Lin. On the, on the reconstruction process, Dr. Lin, Lin's group, analytical chemist at, at, uh, at uh, University of Kentucky, he's sort of a, one of the bridges between the various objectives. I guess he is the critical bridge between objective two and objective three, because he's helping objective two, both with the characterization of the products that we obtain, these monomers and oligomers, and synthesizing the specific oligomers, dimer, trimers, from these monomers that we obtain, which then are handed over to everybody else in objective three to do their, um, their work and, and see if they can identify these new uses for the, for the compounds. So uh, very successful, Dr. Lin uh, developed some really cool chemical technologies, chemical-based technologies in which you use sort of like almost like a click chemistry. You take these monomers and you put them in certain conditions and they bind together, but they always bind the same way. So you obtain very pure materials that then you can sort of characterize, analyze, and see if you can utilize them in various applications. So, and this sort of it transitions into the into the third uh, objective where, for example, some of these compounds were used very uh, successfully to, um, to treat uh, cancer cells in various uh, breast cancer lines and they were found to be very potent, uh, have very potent activity against certain types of cancer. Uh, and we're very excited about that particular, uh, particular result that was a, a collaboration with, with Dr. Liz Martin's group between Dr. Lin and Dr. Uh, Martin here at, uh, at Louisiana State University. Uh, we also sort of uh, have a very good collaborations on that aspect in using this, uh, this uh, specific lignin products to functionalize uh, surfaces, uh, especially nanomaterial surfaces, uh, for example, in silica, uh, on silica surfaces, that was a collaboration with the group at um, at chemical engineering, Dr. Natson and, and Dr. Rankin, in which they functionalize surfaces with both lignin monomers and also use the same lignin monomers uh, with another collaboration at Louisiana State University to make nanoparticles with those particular ones that were used for uh, as as uh, drug carriers for uh, various uh, various 
I guess, compounds uh, and, and chemicals for both drug treatment in uh, humans and in an animal, I think, and, and also carrier as, as carriers for uh, pesticides and other type of compounds for agricultural applications. Um, uh, at the same time, we, we wanted to see, we, have, we were very successful in establishing a collaborations between the modeling group here, Dr. Moldovan at Louisiana State University and the groups sort of both at Louisiana State and University of Kentucky in which he investigated how this, uh, investigated the, uh, from a modeling perspective, how these molecules interact with the phospholipid bilayer, which is basically the layer that surrounds the cells. And he was able to confirm the experimental results obtained at Kentucky in which, and explain why the cells interaction with these lignin compounds behaves in a certain way by the way these lignin monomers or dimers were placing themselves either on the surface of the membrane, into the membrane, or even passing through the membrane and making, making pores and opening pores in them. So those were very, very successful. Uh, and another group here was very successfully using um, some of these lignin compounds like lignin sul uh, sulfonates, uh, so derivatives of these lignin compounds to make uh, biomaterials that were found to be very uh, good starting materials for um, a tissue scaffold for treatment in wounds and uh, uh, bone, uh, bone uh, uh, scaffold. So you have uh, helps with the bone regrowth, uh, soft flesh wounds, you know, for skin and, and other type of uh, biomedical applications. Objective four of this project was to develop and conduct outreach activities to engage and train the future STEM workforce and to inform the general public by interconnecting the science of plant building blocks and sustainability in the context of food, water, and energy systems. During this project, we were able to develop two units of curriculum for high school students in vocational ag education programs. The two units were titled the introduction to biotechnology and the second was the fermentation unit. These two units consisted of a total of nine lessons. Professional development workshops were hosted for teachers who were piloting this new curriculum to implement in their schools. We had a total of 11 teacher professional development workshops or webinars and 45 teachers who participated in these. Teachers piloted the curriculum and we reached more than 443 students over the course of the three years. In Objective 4, I collaborated with Dr. Joey Blackburn at Louisiana State University in developing the units of curricula that we created for agricultural education teachers. We worked together to co-host the professional development workshop for ag education teachers on the fermentation unit in fall of 2019. And then I conducted the workshop myself with assistance from some of our grad students on the project in the fall of 2019 at University of Kentucky with teachers located in Kentucky. Another piece of the outreach of this project was to promote the broader public awareness of the interface between ag, science, and engineering. This was done through conducting various workshops, um, outreach school events, STEM nights at schools, engineering days at science centers, and at the University of Kentucky Engineering Day over the course of the last three years, amongst other programs in which I was invited to participate within schools. A total of 24 STEM events were hosted over the last few years with a total of 4,644 individuals participating in those events. This number would have been slightly larger had there not been the pandemic this past year and going on currently. Other professional development workshops I've hosted for teachers have been involved with the Kentucky Farm Bureau Teacher and Service Program. Unfortunately, in 2020, those were canceled. However, in 2019, during the summer, I conducted two workshops for teachers from K through 12 um, who taught all grade level subjects to those specializing in the multiple 
different subjects um, from reading to science to chemistry to ag education. 82 teachers attended these workshops and received information and resources on the curriculum that we developed in biotechnology and fermentation. 4-H students were also targeted in some of the workshops that we conducted. During the two summers prior to the pandemic, um, workshops were hosted at the Kentucky 4-H Teen Conference to help youth learn about biotechnology and fermentation. Three workshops were conducted with 35 youth in attendance, as well as some adults who were 4-H agents or parent leaders. The last piece of the outreach program of this project consisted of research training for undergraduate and graduate students. As Dr. Boulder and Dr. Noakes mentioned earlier, mentoring students is a large part of this project in which many students were trained over the courses of summer internship opportunities through Kentucky State University and Southern University at Louisiana, as well as undergraduate students who were in direct were working during the semesters and graduate students. Additionally, postdocs were a part of this project. And in total, we had 24 undergraduate students trained as a result of this project, 14 graduate students and two postdocs. Many of our students have gone on to graduate by this point, being that our project started um, in late 2016. So we have various students working out with the federal government, working in private industry and, and consulting firms across the country um, in well-renowned laboratories and companies um, in which they were sought after as a result of some of the multidisciplinary skills that they were able to receive as well as exposed to as a result of this project. In this project, we developed educational videos to share information about our project and the work that our project members are doing in the departments of biosystems and ag engineering, the department of chemical engineering, and the department of chemistry. These videos were shared on our website. Additionally, a fourth video was developed by two of my undergraduate student summer interns on fermentation experiment that they conducted that teachers can utilize in their classrooms. Across all of these videos, they were viewed 1,914 times from March, 2018 to April, 2020. So we feel like this was a, a great way to share information about our project with the public um, and those interested in the National Science Foundation projects. And we hope that you will visit our other videos and learn more about our project work that we have done. In summary, we are glad to have provided opportunities for youth to learn more about biotechnology and engineering and agriculture through these curricula, as well as the outreach events that we, that we provided in schools and in 4-H. What would you say is the overall success of the project? You know, I would like to emphasize, I think that what the biggest success is that we were able to, to create a cohesive and well gelled group of, of researchers at both our you know, respective universities. Actually, there were three universities involved in Louisiana. We also have the LSU Agricultural Center, which is a separate institution and, and does all the extension and, and, uh, in the agricultural field and research in the education, uh, in the research in the agricultural fields. But I think the other important thing is that we were able to, um, to attract and include in this project as we sort of grown and, and moved along the way, we started with the very core. We basically started with the core of two people, me and Dr. Noakes, though we were the only ones that actually knew relatively well each other. But, but we were able to grow this, you know, this nucleus to maybe four or five, maybe I guess more than that, probably seven or eight or 10 people that have, you know, uh, that have developed significant collaborations with all the members of the group. Uh, and in total, we have probably, I think, maybe like 13, 15 faculty uh, involved, plus all the graduate students, postdocs and undergraduate students. But uh, I think very important, we were able to involve uh, other institutions along these this, this years that were, are usually um, less uh, involved in research, or maybe they have, um, 
certain barriers of, uh, of, of accessing high quality research. We developed collaborations with Kentucky State University and Southern University, which are uh, historically black uh, institutions of higher education, one of them in Kentucky, one of them in, in Louisiana. We also developed collaborations with uh, Louisiana Tech University, which is another smaller university in the state of Louisiana. So I think the fact that we were able to sort of incorporate these different institutions and different mentalities into our project, I think that's what the biggest success of our, of our project is, is that we are actually able to create a, a working team. And, and I think that was the sort of the main mission. Yes, yeah, so in addition to the collaboration, another major outcome for the project was the professional development of our students. So we had a lot of undergraduate students and graduate students involved in the project, and they received an education that was different from what most undergrad and graduate students experience because they got to experience firsthand multidisciplinary research. And you could see it in their, um, in their skills as they developed that they were, um, they were able to think multidisciplinarily. And that's a, that's a well, um, that's so a skill that a lot of um, employers want. And so, communicate, and communicate. And communicate, right, communicate interdisciplinary. So um, our graduate students that have completed their studies have gone on to really good jobs like consulting companies or chemical industries, pharmaceutical companies, and they've been highly sought after because they know lignin, which is a pretty up and coming chemical. And also they know how to collaborate with people, how to communicate and um, yeah, how to collaborate, which is what we have to do for all the upcoming problems that our world is facing. They're all very complex and we need multidisciplinary teams to address them. How will this research lend to future research and developments? Dr. Noakes. Oh, funny you should ask. We just um, completed a grant proposal where we're taking the research that we learned on this project and integrating the, the lessons that we learned so that we can move towards commercialization of some of these products and processes. So our new proposal is on process intensification. So now that we know how to do some cool things with lignin, can we put those things together and do even more impressive things? So we've written a grant there. Last year, we wrote um, a center grant, which is a very big, impressive grant to write. And we were not successful last year, but we're gonna try it again. And I think with the collaborations that we've built, we're in a position to compete quite well for larger funding. So to continue with our national reputation and expand it. Yes, and, and, and I think also sort of along the same, the same lines for the continuing research, uh, we are very proud of our junior faculty uh, that, you know, some of them actually uh, were not even hired at the time that the grant was written. Uh, so we didn't even know what sort of their capabilities were and what were they going to be able to do. Um, and uh, we're very proud that they were successful uh, to build out their sort of professional network uh, using our, our grant as a sort of a skeleton on which they start building up their collaborations and their, their uh, you know, careers, academic researchers' careers. And uh, we're very proud that they were very successful in, you know, securing a significant amount of, of federal, competitive federal funding for their programs. And a lot of these were based on ideas that they sort of developed and worked on while collaborating on this on this grant. So uh, the way I like to, you know, sort of think about that is we, we gave them some some ideas, we give them, you know, give them wings and then we open the windows for them. And they, you know, they're able to take flights and, and you know, uh, develop as researcher in, in their own. And uh, I think I think that's very important for a sustainability of of, you know, this field in general, you know, utilization of renewable resources for solving the problems that the society faces. And I think, you know, they and our graduate student and undergraduate students are 
you know, sort of the will be the the motor, the engine that's going to power this, you know, new bioeconomy with the skills that they acquired and uh, hopefully all the things that they've learned in our project.